Joint. I'm going to talk to you today about retainer native architecture. Uh, so, Boyd talked a lot about some of the advantages of Docker and uh, Boyd talked uh, in the beginning of the of today's sessions uh, about the, a lot of the advantages of Docker, and there was a number of us, including myself, who, who've been running Docker in production, and uh, and so getting Docker into production just as a okay now we've Dockerized this application is a great first step to saying oh now we're using now we're taking advantage of containers and now we have a container native architecture, uh, or now we. We, we're using containers, but that's not the same as a container native architecture. What I'm going to argue today is that a container native architecture is about taking the full advantage of containers uh, above and beyond kind of the, the basics of isolation. So containers as they exist in Linux are an opinionated de deployment of isolation. So we have we had VMs, those were great. Um, anybody who did rack and stack here, you know, knows that VMs are a huge improvement over that. Um, you know, another uh, modern implementation is unit kernels, which I think you're crazy if you're running them, but that's that's an opinion you can have too. Um, and so, Docker a, as an implementation of containers is, is to say, we're going to uh, we're going to isolate things by doing operating system virtualization and not machine virtualization. And that's that's a very important distinction, and I think is is what is the what is what enables um, kind of the full the full advantage of the cloud. So this question of like what, what does that what does that really mean? So I'm I'm going to argue that uh, it isn't about fast containers versus thin containers. It isn't which of the umpteen million scheduling tools that are out there now you can use. Um, it is about uh, it's about this. Containers is a first class citizen, and most and more importantly, each container being a first class citizen on the network. That means containers cannot be ghettoized inside the host. Containers need their own IP address. And that's a, that's a kind of a, a harsh opinion to have, but I think that you're gonna find that um, if you go with that, then you're gonna be able to take advantage of, of, of containers to the fullest. Um, so kind of, Boyd stole my thunder on this one, but like our mission as, as operations people, as developers, is not to manage VMs. I mean, unless that actually is your mission, in, in which case, you know, there, there are some people who do that. Um, but but your your mission is whatever your application does for your organization, right? So like if you're if you're a business making a lot of money, if you're a nonprofit, you know serving your users. Um, so the 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 infrastructure that we stand up to serve VMs and to serve our containers is undifferentiated heavy lifting, right? That's work that ideally we can get rid of, right? If if, it, if it's at all possible. Um, and so the, so the value proposition of application containers is you know, elasticity, utilization, isolation. But the only way that we can take, take advantage of that is if they're first class citizens. And that means that the notion that like, oh, you don't have to change anything about your, about your application, excuse me, you don't have to change anything about your application, you just stick it in the container and run it, I think that's a broken model. And I think that you can do it, and you will get, you will get very far with that. But if you want to take full advantage of it, you need, you need to have a, a, a slightly different model. Uh, so I want to tell you a story. So right now I'm uh, I'm the product manager at uh, at Joint. Uh, we make the Triton Elastic Container Service, uh, where you can run uh, containers securely on bare metal in the public cloud. Uh, we use that uh, with LX brand Zone. So we're actually running an open Solaris derivative uh, called SmartOS. Uh, we've been running Linux containers uh, for ten years uh, in that way. Uh, Triton, uh, our, our new product this year, is a Docker API. So that means that on that data center, so that means that you can use your Docker run command on your laptop and send containers up across the entire data center and use that data center as a single Docker host. Um, or use your data center as a single Docker host because this is all open source and you can run it on prem. Uh, but I've only been at Joint for a couple of months, and before that I was at with this company, uh, which is up the street here, uh, Drama Fever. I was the director of DevOps, uh, which is a ridiculous title. Um, <laughs> So what we did there is we, we streamed foreign dramas, uh, foreign dramas and rom-coms, uh, so K-dramas, telenovelas, uh, British, uh, British dramas, some movies. Uh, we also ran uh, a site for, or we also run, I should, I should say, uh, a site for Sundance uh, called Doc Club, which is documentaries. Um, this site that they launched this last summer called Shudder, uh, this is for AMC. Um, this is really scary, this is not their kids. Um, <laughs> We were deployed entirely on AWS. Uh, our main application was a big, giant Django mon Python monolith. Uh, we started adding Go a lot of Go microservices uh, over the last couple of years. Um, 
kind of the, the, a lot of the typical AWS deployment stuff here. So auto scaling, uh, we had because we're, we're an entertainment entertainment company, and you know there is such a thing as primetime TV on the web. Uh, we had have swings of load about 10 to 20 times over the course of the day. Um, so, uh, and we were running around about 100,000 requests a second at our peak load. So you know not Facebook size, but not like you know mom and pop's web story. Did. Uh, and we've been running, we were running Docker in production since October 2013. And I'm sure there are some of you who are saying, I'm going to leave and go to the other talk now because this person is crazy. Uh, <laughs> but this was actually solving a very serious problem that we had. Um, this was a big part of it, right? So it works on my machine. Uh, we had a major problem with the divergence between the local development environment and, and uh, what was going on, on in production. Um, we had slow non-atomic deploys. I'm going to be ashamed to say that when I started at Drama Fever, our deployment mechanism was at effectively SSH in a for loop with a git pull in there. Um, don't do that, by the way. Um, you, you can wrap it in the fabric, which is the Python tool to do that, and then it looks like you're doing DevOps, but still SSH in a for loop. Um, dependency isolation uh, was a major problem. Um, we were a Python shop, but if you, if you run Ruby or Node or PHP, you have a very similar problem. Uh, you know, so there's this idea of virtual env in Python where you say, okay, well, we're going to package this application up and it's going to be this isolated environment, but it doesn't isolate your shared C library very well. Um, and that those C libraries will diverge between uh, the, you know, the OSX machine that your developer is using and your Linux uh, machine that, that you might be using in production. Uh, of course, you can use Vagrant, you should be if, you're, if you have this environment. Uh, but uh, what would end up happening was is that to provision those machines, those bigger machines for the full stack, it would take like a half hour. So if the, if you know a new dependency came down from you know okay that got merged in the master, now all the developers have to go and do that. Um, what would effectively happen is the developers wouldn't do it, um, and so their local machine would start to drift, and then they would have to like these horrible merge things that they'd have to do, you know, largely in the last half hour before we went to production, which is not a great idea. Okay, so we our version one of the fix to that is as many people uh, who are running on AWS do, and you should if you're not running Docker is AMI. So you make a server server image for each application for each deploy, um, and then you deploy it by standing up an entirely new stack. So you bake that image, you stand up a new stack, you flip it over, right? And that can be good because you have minimal infrastructure, you have new deploys. This is the kind of the promise of DevOps that we you know this is the kind of the promise of what. Uh, the, the cloud uh, computing method of, de of, de of deployments is. Um, but it's not perfect. Um, for starters, it's really slow to do that. Um, you know, a VM takes a couple minutes to provision, right? So if you have to provision an entire stack, particularly when you're running at 100,000 requests a second, now you're talking about you know, some serious time to get that blue green deployment up. Um, having one VM per service, which is kind of what that model wants you to do, uh, runs into a very poor utilization. Um, Particularly because if you if a, if a given service is lightly loaded, you're going to start scaling it down. So you're going to say, you know, and again, in the AWS environment, uh, you you want to make sure that you're deployed across three availability zones for redundancy. So now you've got you know five or six services, each with three VMs when you're at your low at your low load, because you want to have them there for redundancy. But they're all lightly loaded, so you have this really really poor utilization. Um, if you want to add more services, which we were doing increasingly, we were kind of moving, you know, starting to pull pieces out of that giant Django monolith, um, you're going to start adding more AMIs, more VMs, more EOBs. Um, and in, in our environment, uh, we didn't really have a, a strongly integrated uh, operations and development team. And so that our, my, my small ops team, which was very small at the time, uh, owned all that extra gear. Uh, oh, by the way, don't do that. Um, if, you, if you're doing this, don't have completely spread. Um, and I may have mentioned that the fun was really slow because that was super painful, particularly when there was a critical bug that slipped through deployment, slipped through QA, and then it would land in production, and then you're like, okay, that really, really slow and expensive uh, deployment, now we have to roll it back. And, and so that was All right, so version two, uh, we went with Docker. Um, and we did it completely, and I, I, I'm gonna stop my slide here for a second. We did it completely the wrong way. We took our giant monolith app and we dapperized that first instead of saying, let's do a, let's do a small greenfield project. Um, I wouldn't recommend that, but it did work out for us in the long run. Uh, so there's some great stuff with this. So we have this human and machine readable build documentation. And what I mean by that, the Docker file. Um, the interesting thing, the side effect that we totally didn't like, anticipate with this was that onboarding like, went from like a day-long process to very, very short. So, um, and, and Boyd alluded to this in his talk, um, 
the, the last person I heard from my team was up and running with the entire production staff on his laptop in 15 minutes, um, which was pretty awesome. Um, obviously, no more works on my machine. Uh, you know, the same container that passed through our CI system that, that went to the dev, the QA environment, to production, uh, could then be pulled back down to the development environment, the developer environment to, for testing and for further development. Um, fix the, fixes the uh, dependency isolation, honestly, kind of by sweeping under the rug. Right? Um, but what this really means is that, you know, Ops doesn't, Ops doesn't care what crazy shit you put in your container, really, um, in, in most cases. Um, and I, I'm a big fan of the interface uh, metaphor, by the way. Uh, so it created an interface-based model to development, which, which means that the operations team could say to the developers, look, here's the minimum interface you need for your application to work. And that is, you know, if you log like this, if you expose a health check that looks something like this, if you're stateless in this way, you're good to go, you can put whatever you want in your application. Okay, so, oh, and the bug is much faster, which solved the ingredient when we got it, it was so slow, um, which was great. Okay, so, of course, uh, I, now normally there would be a obligatory container disaster slide here, but I decided to, you know, lie back because I think you can see it fine. All right, so this is, the, this is kind of like what the, the typical uh, topology you see of these kind of, the, this, this, these microservice applications built with this, uh, with this model, right? So you have um, the, uh, scaling the, the VMs, each with an application container, uh, they'll of course dynamically scale based on auto scaling. Uh, and then you have an app load balancer in front of them. And so in, in, the, in the Amazon world, that's going to be an ELB. Um, and the ELB is going to make health checks, and it's going to remove nodes as they become unhealthy or, or add them as become. Right? That's simple. Um, and typically what, you'll, or typically what you'll end up doing in that scenario is you'll say, okay, the app at EOB, the internal app at EOB, so will have a well-known well -known name and port name number. So, you know, app1.mycompany.example.com, uh, colon 8080. Um, and you'll route traffic uh, towards that app by changing, or you'll route traffic to that app by going to that domain name. If you want to route traffic away from the app, you change the, domain, you change the DNS record so that it goes to the new ELB, and now you have a way of, of doing blue beam deploys. Um, and the nice, kind of, in theory, one of the nice things about this is that the other, you know, peer downstream applications, so you know, app one talking to app two, can just talk to the ELB. It doesn't have to know about any of the ap application nodes that are behind that. The problem is that the downstream application has to talk to the ELB in order to in order to find its downstream, right? So, so or find its upstream services. So, so obviously, what we have here is we have an extra network hop in every internal request, and that's in. Uh, in a network intensive application, which, if, if we're being honest, is going to be most web applications, uh, that's going to be very really important. Um, one of the other problems with this, this kind of, and I'm going to call this an anti pattern, even though I, I, I designed and deployed this, I'm going to call it an anti pattern now, having run through production. Um, so, one of the other problems we have is NAT, right? So, this is the default bridge networking in, in Docker. Um, uh, what's not really clear here on this slide is that there's there's another virtualization layer here uh, in the, through the Docker game, right? So there's a bridge on the host. Uh, the VF interface is uh, attached to the bridge and then to the container. Um, and then we've got this kind of port mapping in here. Uh, now, in the slide previously, I'll show this real quick, right? So in this environment where we know that we have, we're using the Amazon uh, auto scaling and the EOB, we're using the same port. Uh, for both the external and the internal part of the application. Um, and there's a major problem with that, which should be obvious, but I'll get to it in a sec. Um, but in this slide, I've got, you know, so that there's a network uh, port mapping there. Um, so this is problematic uh, because of performance, right? So in an, in an environment where you have this net, um, the default, the default uh, Docker implementation and networking can cause you performance issues. And this is an IBM, IBM research report, that's not, not just me. Um, but I will tell you that we definitely solved this. Um, so you might say, okay, well, is there a way to get around that? <laughs> Wish that was smaller. Okay, um, you could do have post networking, right? So uh, the major problem with this is, of course, it completely breaks multi-tenant security, right? You can't have post networking if you have un untrusted uh, container. Now, in our environment at Drum Fear, we didn't have that, but it was something that we were looking at doing because we had completely separate stacks for each of those three sites. Um, and so this prevented us from merging those together and, and taking advantage of, you know, some of those sites having lower utilization than others. Um, it creates port conflicts, obviously. So, you know, in this example, I have three applications. I can't have two versions of application A without doing an app. Um, 
And you know, and and so this is going to create the utilization. This is going to make the utilization problem uh, be first. Um, another option is bridge networking, uh, and that's not the same as dash dash bridge, which is what Docker does by default. It's really not. Um, it includes a bridge. Um, it's kind of confusing terminology. Um, so here you can get an IP per container. Um, in some environments, you might need a second NIC to do this uh, with certain cloud providers. Uh, in, uh, in Kubernetes, generally what you end up with is a subnet per host as a way of doing the, uh, the IP namespacing, um, which creates some scaling issues. Um, this isn't bad, though. Um, this, is, uh, this is actually the closest you can probably get to the open Solaris crossbow uh, or, or vSwitch uh, that you can get with Linux alone. Um, we we and try to you know, do all this in kernels. Um, okay, so another problem you have here is, of course, with that architecture, is the single point of failure of those internal load balancers. Now, their their HA very, but of course, you know, even a, a managed load balancer can fail, um, even when you're at fault. Um, uh, this 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 one was uh, Netflix. This, of course, also happened to us because they're also on AWS. Um, this event was human error. Um, was was what the the postmortem said, which I think is terrifying. <laughs> um, but uh, previously to that, there was an, EV, an EVS failure that had happened uh, over that summer, um, and that caused uh, EOBs to fail because, of course, EOB, as, my, as many of the uh, Amazon services were, was built on EVS. And so, uh, even though our application we didn't have EVS anywhere in our stack, or so we thought, we actually did. Um, so even if your application is said, "Oh, we've, we've designed around that known point of failure," like you, know, you can still be hit by it. Uh, funny story on this because is. At this point, it was me and the CTO was the entire operations team. And so I was sitting there like on Christmas Eve, hacking away at standing up HA proxy to replace our load balancer like in a half hour. And be, and the thing that was motivating me was not my business burning, but the burning in my stomach from the fire shooting out of my wife's eyes. Like, why are you working right now? <laughs> All right, so another issue with our picture here is DNS. Uh, so we've got very simple discovery, right? So you just say, hey, I can hard code a C name in my application, and you're good to go. Uh, but you can't really load balance for right DNS, uh, except by Ron Robin. Uh, now, I know that there are um, uh, things like console has some health checking stuff that you can do there, uh, and Robin 3 does, um, kind of in the general case. Um, and uh, TTL caching with DNS can be kind of a pain, uh, depending on your application. So uh, for us, we ran into Django, and Django has this wonderful feature that if you change the C name in your database, it won't remember that, and like you, it dies. So you have to actually restart your application. Um, Nginx for a very long time had all kinds of crazy things going on the way that it does DNS caching. Um, funny story, EOB IP addresses change. Who knew? Um, particularly if the particularly if the service behind it is lightly loaded, so that when um, your developer has their brand new service that they're putting online and they have it in beta and there's like 10 people using it, like the IP is gonna change out from you constantly and that developer is gonna come to you and say, why is my application dying randomly? And it's gonna be fixed to this. Um, so that's a pain. Uh, the other major problem with that architecture, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna preface this by saying, this is not a container specific problem, um, but containers will help us fix this, um, is that naive health checking causes cascading failures. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you an example of that, and you're going to laugh at me because I witnessed this myself. All right, so site is popular, order, you know, which is late in the day, resource usage is climbing, auto scaling triggers, right? So now we're going to start provisioning the VMs to take up the actual load. But uh, we're waiting because VMs take minutes to provision and not seconds or milliseconds that you can in Docker. Um, so eventually, one of your application instances is going to block. Right. So this might be, you know, if you're in Python, you know, this is your unicorn worker is blocking, you sell on an inquiry. Um, you know, uh, if you've got a Node.js application that's done, you know, doing a ton of compute, you can forward faster, um, then, then your application instance is going to block. And at that point, your load balancer is going to say, well, that instance is unhealthy, so let's remove it from the load balancing. So now the resource usage across all the other instances that you have is going to climb. And we're still waiting for those VMs to provision because this kind of failure happens in seconds and not minutes. Um, so that means that more application instances are in the block, uh, your load ba balancer starts to remove more application instances, new VMs finally come online with new app instances, but they're instantly over capacity. And so they start blocking, and now you know, you're getting <laughs> a lot of unhappy people. Um, so in this scenario, we have compute capacity to, to 
to have enough healthy instances, but but we, we don't have, uh, but our, our load balancer are being very helpful in removing those instances before they can have, they can actually get traffic. Um, again, not a container specific problem, but one that containers can help us with, and the architecture that I talk about in a second can help us with. Um, in this situation, what you typically have is a leery eyed operator at 2 a.m. saying, I'm going to turn off the health check just for a few minutes, it'll probably be fine. And then you hope that they're awake enough the next morning to remove it. Uh, okay, so one last problem we have with this is layers, right? So, um, like onions and odors, we have lots of layers here. Um, we have a separate life cycle for the infrastructure and for the applications. Um, if any of you were at ChefConf this year or were at Velocity in New York a couple weeks ago, you saw, might have seen my colleague, my uh, former colleagues, Bridget uh, Cromhout and Pete Chen, give a talk on Docker and Chef and, and the, the implementation that we have with that. So, we had you know, Docker handling the application. And chef handling the infrastructure, and it was you know, and kind of the model of this is you know, hey, it's you've got chocolate in my peanut butter, you got peanut butter in my chocolate, everybody's happy, two great tastes that go better together, and no, this is actually terrible, right? Because now we actually have two entirely separate stacks to handle uh, one piece, which is entirely undifferentiated and heavy lifting, and the other, which is the application which we care about. Um, so this is like, this is the this is this is a, like a, I stole the slide from them uh, with. Um, but like this is the stack that we built, right? So this is, and this, I mean, don't get me wrong, this is cool, right? I mean, this is like, oh yeah, I, you know, we're pushing code and it's creating VMs for us. It's, it's like DevOps magic. It's really awesome, except it totally sucks because again, this is all like undifferent, like nobody should be doing this if we don't have to, right? And and this is basically completely like, like this is not particular to our organization. Like anybody could do this, right? This is, anybody, need, everybody needs to do this if you're running on this, in this kind of architecture. Um, and you have a you have a parallel stack just like this to build your Docker containers, right? Because we have you know the same thing, the same pipeline is going on with with uh, with our containers. Oh, I said that was the last problem, but actually the, the the last problem and the biggest problem I think is utilization, right? So we we have one container for VM in this thing, which means we didn't solve the problem that we were going to try to solve with that, with AMIs, which we had one service for VM. So like that really sucks. So uh, now a way that you might try to work around this is a well we're going to have multiple Multiple containers per per of course, right? That's the obvious sort of thing. Um, the load balancing of that starts to become really complicated, though, right? So one of the ways, so you know, because you have questions like, well, do we remove, remove the entire node because one of the just one of its services dies? Uh, do we need an instance of every service on each VM? Um, you know, if we're running a managed uh, load balancer like EOB, do we have some of those options? So so like, what you'll tend to, and this this is this architecture has been proposed in all seriousness to me at one point. Um, is we say, okay, we're gonna take the VMs and we're gonna register them with multiple load balancers as the as the um, as the container arrives on that uh, arrives on that VM. So we have this like the scheduler that's scheduling the operation, uh, the, the 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 work, and then it has to kick off a, a task to say, okay, and now add that to the load balancer. Um, we still can't, uh, by the way, have more than one copy of the application on the on uh, on, a, on a given host without uh, without that, and we can't find the work with that. So we still have the same kind of problems that we had before. Um, there's, a, there's an alternative, that was, which I like to call the scheduler back, back proxy alternative, um, which is say, okay, let, clearly the load balancer is part of the problem here. So let's get rid of the load balancer and let's put a, uh, an on host proxy. Um, a lot of times you see this done with HA proxy. Uh, this infrastructure is really common with people who've done Mesos Marathon, um, uh, Disney Orbits. You know, they're, they have very smart teams that have done really good jobs with this stuff. Um, and so what you'll have here is a managed proxy, so that so there's an application scheduler, which is which is part of that agent. Uh, that, sorry, this proxy slash agent is a container that says, okay, I know I'm going to be communicating with the scheduling service, with the discovery service, and I'm going to um, reload the configuration as changes come on. Um, and so the update, the agent updates the the configuration of that local proxy, and containers talk only to the proxy. Um, so. We, we, this is this is more complex though, right? So we have one, we have way more containers. Uh, there's a separate life cycle for the VMs and the containers still. Uh, containers still don't have their own IP address. Uh, we have to pass through that proxy for all outbound requests for an application. All our requests are still passing through net or and report back forwarding. Um, we also are going to be start doing things like let's deploy health check code into the into the agent container, right? Which means that now I've bound the deployment cycle of the slash proxy to all the applications. Um, it's also really hard to shut down a VM. And so, I mean, I mean, so in this scenario, like on the on that VM all the way to the right, like if app two goes away or scales down so that 
Now I've got app three there, and I might have this, unless my scheduler is really smart about, about stacking resources, um, which most of them frankly aren't, um, it's really easy to have a situation where like, I only have one VM's worth of work to do and I have three VM's up. Uh, particularly if I have any kind of stake whatsoever in those applications, right? Because if, if I can't just move that application, or if I can't just move that container over to another one and have it pick up the load, um, then, then you're, you're gonna end up with a lot of over, uh, over uh, under utilization rather. So, 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 you know, the, the big thing I'm leading up here too is that we can do better than that. And that the, the answer to that is to remove these kind of middlemen from the containers. Um, the application ha should have the job to discover what it needs for upstream services. The application should be telling our discovery service where to find it, and our application should be reporting this function. So this is the argument I was making before, which is that uh, the notion that you can say, I don't, have to, I don't have to do anything different in my application, I, I think is wrong. Um, we should be pushing the responsibility for application topology to the, away from the network infrastructure, which doesn't have the brains to do this work, and into the application, which includes the scheduler, by the way, which is the only which is the only place that we have the we have the intelligence to, to have a correctly automated solution. Um, think about it this way: like, what are some of the best application monitoring services that are available right now? There's, there are things like New Relic or, or Deferred Power, and Existed, right? And those are things that have agents within the application uh, container, and that's because they're giving us the perspective from inside the application container. CPU percentage, which is you know like your cloud watch measure, is not enough to tell you how you should be distributing it. And in most cloud environments, it's a total lie anyway. So that means that we're, we're saying, okay, containers, you need to have some new responsibilities. And those are, here's who I am. Am I healthy? Hey, discovery service, I'm healthy. Look for changes to the things that I need and respond to those changes. This puts all your state in the discovery service, all, all your state of the application technology in, this, in the discovery service, um, instead of saying, uh, instead of having, um, the, instead of in the, in, in the underlying infrastructure. So this is the model uh, with that. Uh, this, is this, this is effectively the same set of applications we had, but with this model. So we say, we're gonna have applications register with their discovery on, on start. Uh, we're gonna push TTL health checks, and th this is where this uh, question of dealing with the cascading failures happens. Uh, we're going to push TTL health checks to the discovery service. Applications will periodically query this, uh, the discovery service for upstream changes and then respond to them. Um, now, of course, that discovery service needs to be HA, of course. Uh, um, note that here, without these host local proxies and services, this frees us from the VM, right? We can deploy this on bare metal, or of course, I'm going to argue that's not obligated to do so. You should totally be doing it on Triton, so you, you, Entire data center is one uh, Docker host. Um, the app containers are then physically located wherever your placement engine decides, and the scheduling of those of that work is entirely separate from placement. So the application gets to do its job, and the infrastructure gets to do its job. Um, one thing to note on this is that we really don't want to have sidecars in this environment. So the sidecar, a sidecar container has to reach into other containers, which completely breaks multi-tenant security, right? You can't have, you know, you can't have a model where you can do that safely. Um, and you now, and the other problem with sidecars is, of course, you've bound the deployment of your sidecar with the application, right? um, And by getting rid of sidecars, that allows us to have, to, to a degree, not, not available in, in other models, application-aware health checks. So this means, like, I'm not gonna say, oh, well, you know, because you can use, let's say, you know, console has health checks, right? Like, you can say, okay, it's gonna make HTTP queries out to them. And it can actually execute arbitrary, uh, arbitrary binaries to, you, to, to do whatever the health check is. But if, let's say I'm health checking MySQL. Do I wanna package my MySQL client with every instance of my con of console just because I am running MySQL somewhere else? Like, that's, that's binding the, the, the deployments of these two things together in a way that's not make any sense. Um, so we're not packaging tooling any other service. Um, and this also allows us to respond very quickly to changes. Um, I'm, I'm going to demo something that is actually you know, doing polling, but there's no reason that this couldn't be over you know, a web sockets connection or a HTTP long polling connection so that changes are immediately propagated to, any, uh, to the end of the downstream. Um, you know, a pub sub uh, sort of environment. 
All right, so I want to do a demo. Now, I'm not going to be crazy enough to do a live demo, so this is a virtualized demo. Um, but first, we have to talk about this. So I'm saying to you, I'm saying, okay, well, we're going to, uh, or, you know, we're, we're giving your containers new responsibilities, right? So we're saying you can't just do whatever you were doing before. Okay, well, nobody wants to rewrite our apps, right? There are lots of new great apps out there, um, and nobody's going to rewrite them because you'd be crazy to do that. Um, so we need to figure out a way to, to give these responsibilities to a to an app that was built before in the pre-container days. I'm not saying legacy because that's really rude to like these really awesome applications. You know, like Nginx is like my favorite web server. I would never call it a legacy application. That would be horrible, right? Um, okay. So let's look at those responsibilities one by one. Okay. So registration, we can totally do that. We just wrap the start of the app in a shell script. It'll register cool self inspection maybe some kind of self test if the application has that. Um, Okay, so this is actually not so going to be so easy to do uh, as it is. So uh, now you might say, well, what we need is a second process of the container, right? So you can't do that unless you have a supervisor. Um, and, and this is why. So, so I've seen this proposed. Uh, this is way smaller than Okay, I've seen this seriously proposed. Um, okay, so you know, we're saying, okay, we're going to push, uh, we're going to push the registration to the console. We're going to start a health check, some kind of health check name, and then we're going to background it, and then we're going to run our awesome app. Well. And anybody who's done even the tiniest bit of system in here, this, well, what happens when check health awesome app.sh dies unexpectedly? Like, you're no longer getting health checks, right? So don't, don't do that. Um, so we've written this. Uh, now, this is uh, the minimum thing that you could possibly do to solve some of these legacy app problems. Um, so really, all this is is a ship. Um, it's to help make your existing apps container native. Uh, it's written in Go. Uh, it's open source by us under Mozilla Public License. Um, it access PID1 within the container and then forks uh, to the app. Um, it blocks on the app. Uh, it blocks on that fork. So um, what that means is that if the uh, if the application dies, then it will uh, it will exit as well. Um, so for registration, it registers the console on startup. Um, I should point out so it supports this console today. Um, it's totally accessible. It's just you just have to swap that piece of code out. Um, it uh, executes an external health check that you're back packaging inside the same container. Um, it's sending a TTL health check to console. Um, and so what that means is that it, okay, what that means is that if the application fails, console won't get the health check anymore, and so it'll be marked unhealthy, right? So that, that's a very different model from I'm going to push health check to the container. Um, it's going to pull console for changes, and then it's going to respond to change by executing some kind of external response behavior. Um, and those two, and both the external health check and the ex external response behavior, those are both going to be things that you package inside the same container. So the container is completely self-contained in terms of its behavior. Um, this is not the same as a supervisor, right? So this is PID1, but the exit code of the shim process is returned back to the Docker engine or in our case Triton, and then the thing dies, right? Which is what it should do. So that means that if you run Docker PS-A on your dead container, like you will get the exit code of the application and not some weird stuff that this is this is literally like a couple hundred lines of code, by the way. This is totally trivial to do. Um, this could completely be library code, by the way. This is not, you know. Um, this also means that uh, Docker logs will tell you and the Docker log driver will all work correctly um, because it's just attaching to standard instances. Um, and so here's our demo app, um, which I'm going to accelerate through a little bit here. Um, and so this is kind of the, very similar to the app that we had before. So we have uh, some app containers behind here. Uh, these are just like dumb node, uh, node applications that are just serving static files. Um, as they come online, they're going to say, here's my IP address. Uh, I'm helping for the next 10 seconds to console. Uh, and then Nginx is going to say, hey, where, where is app one? And console is going to tell it. Uh, Here's, here's the list of IPs that are for are valid for app one, and then it's going to nginx s reload, uh, which is one of the reasons why nginx is awesome, by the way, um, is that, it, you know, much like HA proxy, uh, it, it knows that I have to be able to receive, receive signals to reload configuration without having to restart the whole damn application. Um, if you write an application and you have to restart it to the reload configuration, like, start over, please. Um, okay, so here, here's our Docker file for that node application. Again, uh, we're just going to install curl in there, and this is HTTP server. This is like the, the first like you know Google Node static servers, and that was what I found. Uh, and then we're adding anybody and some config files to it. Uh, here's our Docker file for nginx. Um, again, we're just uh, adding some you know tools that we need. Uh, console template. I'll get to in a sec. 
um, but it's a tool that allows you to pull a key from console and then write, render it out into a template. Um, and then we're gonna add uh, a header buddy and set, you know, a, a, a really basic virtual list config uh, to get started. Uh, this is what these templates look like. Um, so uh, this is, you can, if you squinted this, you can kind of see the, like an Nginx upstream configuration, uh, virtual list upstream configuration here. Um, and this is kind of a weird Golang template syntax where I'm gonna say for every service, write one of these upstream, put its name there, put its address there. Um, and then if I continue up, um, here's your server, uh, our server listener. So I've got a health check for, for Nginx itself, um, and then uh, an upstream block, a uh, location block. Uh, um, and then within the container, I, and within the Nginx container, we need something to reload Nginx. Uh, we could just, of course, pass Nginx dash reload, or uh, dash, dash, dash reload. Um, but we're going to uh, include this here so that we can um, get the template from uh, uh, console. Um, if you don't need to write templates for your configuration, this is like a complete option. Like um, and then I'm gonna, we're going to orchestrate this with Docker Compose. Of course, you can use whatever you want. Um, and this is pretty straightforward. Um, we have a demo container we're going to run, listen on port 80, link to console. Um, and then the command is just, did you know that there was a multi-line YAML? I, I didn't know that until I wrote this. Um, so that's what that ugly thing is. Um, but we'll, so that's all we're going to do. We're just saying run container buddy with this application. Uh, and this is what the container buddy configuration file looks like. So it's going to say here are the services I, I, I am I am going to be advertising the console, which is the top block, uh, and here are the back ends that I'm going to be looking for changes on, and what to do when I see changes. So it's saying when I find an app, uh, reload engine. Right, so I have a script here that we're gonna, I'm gonna kind of fly through, um, and uh, which would be a demo if I was doing it live. Uh, so we're gonna look at our Docker, we're gonna make sure that our Docker uh, client is posted, pointed at our Docker host, of course, I'm using Triton to do that. Um, so that means I can use the whole data center instead of you know, my local machine. Uh, and I'm gonna start a script here. And I'll, I'll kind of go through the script and I'll kind of jump back and forth with the contents of it. So it does a bunch of Docker polls, not very interesting. And it says, okay, I'm gonna oh, start console, I'm going to write some template values to it, and then I'm going to open the console console. Um, and here's what the script looks like at that point. So at the top here, again, we're, just, we're using Docker Compose because it's convenient, uh, not because it's particularly awesome. Uh, the next step, I need to get a console IP. And of course, uh, because the container has its own IP, I can just use Docker Inspect and say, hey, what's your IP? And now I have it. And I'm going to inject that into the uh, value that I'm sending the console there. And then it opens the console UI, and you can see that we have the template, uh, the console template there, or the uh, virtual host template. Uh, the script then continues and it's going to start up the, the application servers in Nginx. Uh, we're going to, right, so it's going to wait for Nginx to pick up the configuration and then we're going to open the web page. Uh, and that at this point just looks like this. It's identical to the console thing except we're just waiting for Nginx to uh, pick up the initial configuration. Um, and so it's going to serve a page that looks like this. Um, this is what the app server is doing. So that, that it's not a shell one, but the, that value of that that value on the right there is the name of that uh, application container. Uh, and of course, we can say, okay, is that going to scale? And so, as we uh, as we add more uh, application containers, they're going to register themselves with console. And then uh, this page reloads itself every five seconds. And so, um, you know, we're seeing that this is actually working very good. Um, and so, we're seeing that the application. Uh, the, the back end that we're hitting is changing every time because it's just doing round robin. Now, it's doing round robin, but this is an Nginx, right? So we own the virtual host configuration on this, so we, if we want to set it up, if we have paid for you know the commercial version of Nginx where we want to do these cons, like, we can do that. They're, they're, we have total control over, over, our, over our load balancing algorithm. So this is, a, this is like the dumbest demo app that you could possibly do. It's very, very simple. and. And container buddy as an implementation is the thinnest possible shim to do all this stuff. But it does a lot, right? We handle the registration, we handle self introspection, we handle car feeds, looking for change, and responding to change. And this is as scalable as the data store that we're using for the storage service, which, uh, you know, is with something like console. Um, I, I haven't actually run it in, in like at Surrey scale in production, but um, a very small cluster, console cluster can handle fairly large, you know, a, a mid sized. Uh, application set like the one we had around fear, a couple hundred nodes, trivially. Um, and this could be, and again, this could easily be library code, right? So if you have a green field application, building this kind of be behavior into your application at the beginning is probably the way to do it rather than having these kind of these shims. So 
this kind of this is the kind of the, the old way model that we were talking about here. Um, and 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 to say old way is is kind of being silly, right? Because we're talking like in the last couple of years with containers, this is how we've been doing it. And I'm going to argue that these things on the right are the container with native way to do it. So that's going to say that um, container native isn't about what scheduling framework you're using. It's not about the size of the containers. You know, is it 200 gig or is it a, uh, you know, a 10 gig? Um, it isn't about how many processes are in a container. It's not, it's, it is about containers being first class citizens, applications owning and responding to change. Um, it is about focusing on building your app and not on differentiated heavy, uh, heavy lifting of your infrastructure. Um, and I'm going to argue that deploying on secure multi tenant barrier hardware is the best way to do that. Um, and of course, to do it on the right. Um, this is, oh, well, my slides will be there. Um, and uh, we're also sponsoring uh, lunch tomorrow. Join is also sponsoring lunch tomorrow, and there'll be some promo codes uh, for anybody who wants to try it. Thanks. I think I have a few minutes for questions. Yeah. So oh, and I have one of these. I'll be able, I guess. I'm not even sure. Uh, so, you, so you mentioned that having the application reports on Helm prevents the, uh, the cascading failure problem. But if the, if the application isn't able to report its own health because it's heavily overloaded, can you still run into the same problem? Right, right. But then in that scenario, what you end up with is the, the scheduler at that point actually knows that that's the failure mode that you have. And so because the applicant, because your scheduler should be you know aware of the, the, those parameters of the application, that's um, like you can build that into it instead of it just coming to the dumb HTTP check. But I mean, you still have to you still have to design it, but you actually have the option to do so now. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's not a solve, it's not a solve complete, it's not a solve problem, it gives you the opportunity to solve. Part of your list is the things that um, a container should do, and you mentioned the chocolate and peanut butter job. Um, should a bill of providing a bill of materials be maybe added to the list so that we know what's in the container? Yeah, I mean, I think that like that that this was really kind of more about the operational side. I mean, I think in terms of like the build side, and I, I think like Docker files is a good start for that. Um, and I think that um, some of the things that we're seeing with uh, sorry, I can't remember that, Docker Notary. Uh, in terms of like making sure that the provenance of the container is known, I, I think is really um, is, is really important. Um, having like making the scheduler aware of that, um, I think is something that um, I don't know that there's any good tooling around yet. But but there's there's no shortage of new tooling on on, <laughs> on Docker in case anybody hasn't noticed that. So. Okay. I know everyone's lunch. All right, thanks, folks. You don't get one.